We finally got the long-awaited update from SpaceX and the FAA on the second test flight of Starship. Both the FAA and SpaceX released statements to the media detailing the reasons for the explosion of the second flight booster in ship and give us a detailed path ahead. Let's dive into all the details. In the statement by the FAA, the agency confirms that SpaceX has closed the mishap investigation into the Starship Super Heavy Vehicle. This investigation is SpaceX-led and was then accepted by the FAA with the 17 corrective actions that SpaceX has proposed to the agency. The agency goes into further detail and confirms that of these 17, 7 are part of the Super Heavy Booster, while 10 are related to Starship. In a letter written yesterday by the FAA to SpaceX, it indicates SpaceX conducted separate mishap reports for Booster 9 and Ship 25. In this letter it states that the mishap report for the booster was completed on February 5th and the one for the ship was completed on February 16th. So that means only 10 days passed between SpaceX completed the last of the mishap reports and the FAA wrapping up its review of them and considering the mishap investigation concluded. The agency details that part of the 17 corrective actions includes vehicle hardware redesigns updated control system modeling, re-evaluation of engine and analysis based on OFT2 flight data and updated engine control algorithms. Or in TLDR, apply the lessons learned to the next flight. Makes sense, right? These are things SpaceX would investigate anyway to achieve a higher chance of success on flight 3. The FAA also points out that a list of these corrective actions does not mean a go for a third flight of Starship. SpaceX will need to implement these items and the FAA will need to sign off on them, while also awaiting further information from SpaceX for the license modification. So what does SpaceX say about all of this? Let's start with what happened to the booster. According to SpaceX, when the booster tried to relight the middle ring of 10 engines, the engines began to shut down immediately after one by one until one of the engines failed energetically, basically an explosion, and that caused the booster to break up. In this update, SpaceX explained that the most likely reason for this was a filter blockage leading to a loss of inlet pressure in the engine oxidizer turbo pumps. This then led to an explosion of the engine and subsequently the vehicle as well. There are probably some of you who may not know what some of this means, so let's break it down. The Raptor engine burns liquid methane using liquid oxygen and both are pumped into it using turbo pumps. These turbo pumps have an inlet each and the one SpaceX refers to is the oxidizer turbo pump, so that's the one that pumps liquid oxygen into the engine for it to work. For that to happen, the inlet pressure into the turbo pump needs to be the appropriate one or else the turbo pump can be damaged. As it draws a lower flow of liquid oxygen then, that can cause cavitation, aka bubbles of gas, that can damage the pumps and trust me, you don't want to damage pump blades that go a thousand of revolutions per minute. In the case of the super heavy explosion, a filter to the oxidizer turbo pump inlet was blocked which led to a lower pressure and as mentioned, that can have catastrophic consequences. Now the big question is what exactly blocked the filter? Was it debris on the tank? Was it something crumbling off from the tank itself and going into the filter? We sadly don't know any more details about it and of course only SpaceX and the FAA would know. Another question remains pertaining to the other engines that were shutting down. Why did they shut down in the first place? Was it related to filter blockage? Was it something else? Once again, another question that we have and sadly can't answer yet. According to the FAA, SpaceX has implemented for the next flight a redesign of the vehicle to increase tank filtration. That sounds kind of important given what they found out about blocked filters. It also makes mention of reducing slosh in the booster, which likely means SpaceX was probably not happy with the sloshing that occurred during the flip of the boost back burn. It would definitely be interesting to know more about how that went. Other items mentioned include updated thrust vector control system modeling, which is interesting given that Booster 9 was the first one that flew with electric thrust vector control, more commonly known as gimbaling. The wealth of data gathered during this mission probably gave SpaceX the opportunity to update how this control works and what is the response of it when actually used in flight rather than on the ground. 
This also ties in with the other two items the FAA mentioned, which are the re-evaluation of the engine analysis based on the Flight 2 data and updated engine control algorithms. As Jack would say, more data more better, so of course SpaceX is using this data to improve systems ahead of the next flight. The hope, obviously, is that these corrective actions identified on the mishap investigations are already on Booster 10 and will all work correctly during Starship's third flight. Now, that was the booster, but what about the ship? Well, SpaceX says that Ship 25 had a planned vent of excess liquid oxygen near the end of its burn. This additional propellant had been loaded onto the vehicle to gather data about future payload missions and needed to be vented before re-entry. So SpaceX basically flew with more propellant than needed for this flight. According to the FAA letter, the dump started at 13.09.55 UTC, or essentially at T plus 7 minutes and 5 seconds. Once this vent started, a leak developed on the aft section, which started fires and produced explosions within it. These fires and explosion led to a loss of communication between the flight computers on the aft end and the forward portion of the vehicle that triggered the shutdown of the six ship engines and the activation of the autonomous flight safety system. According to the FAA, the AFTS was triggered exactly one minute after the dump started. This failure mode may sound familiar to some, as something like this occurred during Flight 1. Fires developed in Booster 7's engine bay that caused a loss of control due to wires being destroyed and the engine being cut off from the flight computers. Sometimes it is hard to know where a fire might start on a vehicle and what circumstances may lead to it, which is why SpaceX does these flight tests in order to find any issues. These issues on the ships weren't known compared to Booster, since the first flight never got to ship ignition or even separation. So again, more data, more better. Unfortunately, we don't know how the leak started and the ignition source for these fires could have been the engine running themselves or could have been anything else. There's a lot of stuff going on at the aft section of the ship. The FAA indicates that the 10 corrective actions for the ship include hardware redesigns to increase robustness and reduce complexity. It seems like SpaceX may have already accounted for this corrective action that needed to be addressed. Ship 28 is already more robust and less complex than Ship 25, with more stringers in its liquid oxygen tank and less vents on the ship overall. Other items include hardware changes to reduce leaks, flammability analysis updates and installation of additional fire protection. Adding additional fire protection could be as simple as fire-resistant insulation over the wire bundles, as well as rerouting wiring to locations where they are less likely to get damaged from a fire. Another important note is that it seems like SpaceX also plans to eliminate the liquid oxygen dump prior to engine cutoff. Things like modeling updates or the performance of transient load analysis, which is the process of finding out the dynamic response of a structure, is how SpaceX can better understand how the ship's structure behaves while it flies and if any changes need to be made down the line. So it sounds like a lot of things went wrong during Flight 2. Nah, not really. After all, the vehicle reached an altitude of 150 km with a velocity of 24,000 km an hour. Normal orbital speed is roughly 27,000 and of course with this we expect a bit less since they do not go full orbital. So a bit under 3000 km per hour short of the expected speed at engine cutoff. SpaceX once again confirmed in their statement that a lot of things went right. All 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster started up successfully and completed a full duration burn for the first time. As SpaceX pointed out, a first for a vehicle this size looking at UN-1 rocket. Although, technically, Starship kinda is the first vehicle for its size, so everything will be a first. Also, the burn of the ship worked mostly well as well. All six Raptors flew a normal ascent until seven minutes into the flight. They also confirmed that the change to electric from hydraulic steering on the ship will remove potential sources of flammability and that the water-cooled deflector pad and all the other pad upgrades performed as expected. This results in minimal post-launch work to be ready for the next flight. So overall, stage zero was a big win. If you compare flight one to flight two, you can see the huge improvements that SpaceX has made between flights. Speaking of all three flights, our patch for the third Starship flight test is available in the store. Check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com. So where does this leave us? 
Well, SpaceX still does not have a launch license modification. Currently, the launch license for Starship only allows them to perform the second flight. But according to the FAA, SpaceX already has applied for a modification of it to allow subsequent launches. Getting a modification here would mean they could fly again, so we'll keeping an eye on what happens as this is the next step after closing of the mishap investigation. Of course, SpaceX did not start working on this right now. We already saw modifications on the booster, and there are most likely other modifications already in place before the list was even submitted. The paperwork does not come before the work, but happens next to it. Next to this is hardware readiness. They just completed a spin prime to verify engine modifications on ship 28. They are still working on booster 10 in the mega bay and the OLM and tank farm were just tested in a multi-hour event to prepare for the next wet dress rehearsal. After this, a WDR is next. Assuming this WDR goes well, there was a gap of 24 days between the WDR and the launch of the second flight. SpaceX probably can remove some of that time and reduce the turnover time. So we will see one final D-stack after the WDR, the arming and installation of the flight termination system, and then a final restack. Once that is all in place, we will probably see regulatory things popping up. Road closures, air restrictions, marine notices, evacuation notices, and finally, a post from SpaceX detailing the launch. Once we are there, the excitement will go up and is, as always, guaranteed. When do you think we will see the third flight? Are we spot on with our steps? Let us know in the comments.